Thank you so much for uh, having me today. Even without my harmonica, I'm allowed back here today. That's very impressive for me. So um, I'm here to talk about data journalism and how we do it at The Guardian. I suppose the first thing to say is that this is not about maths. Yeah, I'm not very good at maths. It's, uh, when I was at school, the, uh, the school teacher said that I tried hard but had little natural ability. So, so to me, this is about how we tell stories in a, in a modern way. So I suppose the first thing to say about this is that we treat data journalism as if it's a very new phenomenon, as if it never existed uh, before a few years ago. And in fact, um, data journalism and numbers have been around as, certainly as long as The Guardian. This is uh, uh, the very first news page from the very first uh, Guardian newspaper of 1821. And in those days, there was no news on the front page. It was all adverts on the front page. And uh, all the news was on the back. And, uh, but you can see there is a big table of data taking up most of the front page. And all that data is is just a list of schools in Manchester, which is where The Guardian was published, and uh, a list of how many pupils are each one and how much each one cost. Now, nowadays, this would be uncontroversial data. It would not be difficult to get hold of. But in 1821, this was very, very political because most children didn't go to school. They worked during the week. They learned to read and write on Sundays. And this was leaked to us. And it was leaked to us by somebody uh, in the same way that WikiLeaks was leaked to us recently, by somebody who wanted to make things better by revealing what's going on in society. So the idea is that if we know and understand what's going on, we can make things better. So that rationale is, uh, for our work is still the same, but now I guess the presentation of it has changed. This is something we do every year and it's incredibly popular. It just shows uh, government spending in Britain by different government departments, how much spends the most money. It's very political data at the moment. But getting hold of this, even in a country like the UK, which is very transparent, has a government committed to transparency and openness, it's not simple. We have to get it from uh, government annual reports, which are published in a PDF format, which is where data goes to die. This is a way for governments to look as if they're being transparent without really doing it. And we have to get that and extract it. And every year when we publish it, we get a phone call from different government departments who want copies of it because they don't have that information. So it's changed our role. We have become a place now, a provider of information, a curator in a way. It's all about curation now. There are so many sources of data for people. You've got uh, government data sites around the world, data.gov in America, data.gov.uk in the UK. These things are everywhere. But how do you start as a reader? Where do you begin? So we want to be the place that people come to begin. And I suppose our first mission of that is this idea of opening up this data and democratizing it and making it easier for people to understand. So in a way, it's about making it public. And this is what we do. Most days we do this, which is the Guardian data store. And every day we'll publish stories around data in the news. We analyze them, we visualize them. But crucially, we publish that data and make it available. And I'll just show you some examples of some things we might do recently. So this is something uh, close to home comparing North and South Korea in terms of population and economy size and so on. Uh, sometimes what we do is we showcase things we like that other people have done with our data. So for instance, this was done by a developer in, on the west coast of America where we published data about drone strikes in Pakistan over a number of years. And what this guy did with that data, which was uh, published originally by the Bureau for Investigative Journalism, and they visualized that for us. And then we showcased their visualization on our site. Now, it was, it's not that long ago that a journalist would never publish a graphic on their site by somebody else, but that's changed now. It's much more about being the one place, the one destination. Uh, we might do things like this, where, for instance, we took um, data on terrorism attacks in America since the 1970s, after the Boston attacks, and just show the kind of spread and where things have happened and over what kind of period of time. And one thing we've learned as well is it's really important for data to be personal, for people to be able to share it. So, for instance, this was done by our interactive team in the United States, in New York. It's based on gay rights across different American states, and crucially, it allowed people to share with their Facebook friends. So you can see how your state compares to your friend's state. 
and had something like 70,000 shares in a day because it was allowed to share and kind of opened up to people and made quite complicated data more personal. And often that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make the impersonal more personal. And sometimes we're trying to make things more fun as well. So this is a map of the world's chocolate trade, and it's made out of chocolate. That was, um, that was good fun, making that map and eating it afterwards. And um, sometimes what we try and do is very much kind of open up data and make it more available. And we really had this around the Olympics. So the Olympics are interesting because that data is there for us all to see. We can watch the games. You can see somebody running a race. But that data behind it, of how fast they ran that race, that's owned. It's proprietorial. It's owned by the International Olympics Committee. You then sell it for large amounts of money to different news organizations. So we thought, how can we open up that data and make it more available? So we uh, ran a site, which is a kind of open data site during the Olympic Games, which is this site here. And if you Google London Olympics data, you'll still find it. And basically, every day, we publish often very quick uh, news stories around the Olympics, often just in a couple of hours. It might be uh, comparing uh, Michael Phelps. If Michael Phelps were a country, how big would he be? Um, that kind of thing. And um, just opening up the data. So for instance, we published the data for every single athlete in every single event and allowed it to be downloaded. Now, this is the first time that's ever happened. And maybe only a few people would go to the effort of actually downloading that data. We wanted it to be there. We wanted it to be visible so that developers could then take that data and do stuff with it. The other thing we wanted to do was kind of mash up the Olympics data with stuff that we can all get hold of to try and kind of tell new stories around the games. And one of those stories was around the medals table. Now, Olympic medals are interesting because um, you know, we all care about who's number one, who's number two, where's the USA, where's China, where's Team GB, especially because it was in London this year. But actually, um, what if a very small country suddenly wins a lot of medals? They punch above their weight. How do you show that? How do you express that? So what we thought was we should weight that data you could weight it by population or team size or the size of the economy. And um, so we worked with some statisticians at Imperial College in London, because this is kind of tricky data work. And they helped us make a kind of weighted table of the game. So for instance, that's the official um, medal table there with uh, US and China at uh, number one and two. But if you look at it by population, Grenada, with its one gold medal, zooms up to the top of the table. You see New Zealand comes number four. And the New Zealand government were doing their own version of this during the games. You can see why, right? Um, and then you look at it by size of the economy, uh, different countries come up, or by the, even by the team size. It changes how you look at the games. And that's what we're always trying to do, is try and create new ways of looking at things. If data journalism is anything, it's simply just telling a story in the way it should be told, the best way possible, using all the techniques that we have. So the other thing that's, I guess, the change for us is that we're not only writing about data, we're providing data now. So the data blog gets about 3 million pages a month, um, which means, makes us possibly the most popular data site in the world, which is a very strange position for us to be in. And we publish data using Google Spreadsheets, which we originally did as a kind of cheap way of doing it, because we couldn't afford to get the database done. We didn't have any development time. And we started doing this, and it's worked out very well as a kind of very robust way to share that data. It means that people can share it, developers can write programs around it, and it's available. And the other thing we've noticed is that often now we're seeing much bigger data sets, uh, you know, data sets that are, uh, would have been unmanageable for journalists a few years ago. But those data sets are often about much smaller things, very small localities. So for instance, um, this was um, uh, something we did with the WikiLeaks data, which we were leaked about Iraq. And that had 400,000 rows of incident, incidents, and each one was an incident that a uh, US Army unit was involved in. And we realized that the big story there was just the sheer numbers of people that died, 109,000 people died, um, that were recorded in this uh, database. So we created this just using Google Fusion Tables. It's a free mapping tool. It took about half an hour to make. And it just shows each incident is mapped as one dot where at least one person died. And it shows you the patterns of the war in ways that you would never be able to, to get or understand in a thousand word article. But you can see it in a graphic that takes hardly any time to make. And that's a very kind of powerful position for us to be in as journalists, that we can make things that explain a story very, very quickly. Um, the other thing we try and do 
is try and incorporate our readers into the story because we have readers who are interested in this stuff. And that's why kind of crowdsourcing is called now. You know, we used to call it surveying, but essentially it's crowdsourcing. And we did it with MPs' expenses. And it works OK for us. But as journalists, we're always in a hurry. So what we find now is it's better. We gain more from working with people outside who are good at this stuff. So one company we've worked with in the past is called Zooniverse. And what they do is they specialize in many things. This interactive here is something they made by crowdsourcing old Royal Naval record books from the ships. So every day, the captain of the ship would record the location and the, the, uh, the coordinates of the ship and the temperature as well. And they crowdsourced hundreds of these things and, and created this beautiful kind of interactive for us. And it's a, it's a way of looking at that data, but getting a community to manage it for us. So these guys, the community did it all themselves. I suppose the other thing for us to say that's really important is that in the past, journalism was very much about us as journalists sitting in our ivory tower and giving our pearls of wisdom to you, the reader. It was very much a one-way process. And the internet has changed that for good. We're no longer the only experts in town. There are many, many experts out there. And if we can involve them in our work, it makes our work a lot stronger. So that's what we mean, I guess, by open journalism. And every day on The Guardian, we publish a news list of The Guardian every day with who's writing which story, what it's about. And we ask our readers to help us. You know, what stories are we missing? What could we be doing that would be better? And sometimes that is an uncomfortable process for us. So for instance, I made this map showing poverty in London, which I thought was very good. I was very happy with it. And within minutes, somebody had tweeted and said, those colors are a fail. That's an awful map. So my first reaction was to be quite cross about that. Yeah, how dare you question my map-making skill? And I thought, well, what would you do to it? What colors would you use? And the reason that map was bad is because it would be invisible to somebody with color blindness. A red-green color blindness wouldn't be able to see it. And I hadn't even thought of that. And so we spent a long time, a couple of hours, negotiating via Twitter and talking about how we could make it better and ending up with something like that, which is a lot better. So by involving our readership, we've made our kind of product a lot better and a lot easier to understand. And now we do this every day. We have a Flickr group where we showcase things from our readers have done, and we, we showcase those on the site as well. But the whole point about this, I guess, is that now anybody can do this. This is a, a punk diagram from 1977, a, a punk fanzine. And it says, this is a chord, this is another, this is the third, now form a band. And in a way, data journalism is like that. There are so many tools that we all have access to now. Anybody can form a band. And the kind of visualizations people make have gone from things like this a few years ago, incredibly popular charts on the web, to um, things like this using Tableau Public, which is incredibly sophisticated. This is a free, a free charting and mapping tool that anybody can use. And so the power in creating this work has gone from the developers towards the journalists and towards the members of the public. You know, people can just use this stuff and make it available. But the other side of that is that when you can work with a designer, things can really shine in a way that is hard to do using free tools. So this is done around the Afghanistan WikiLeaks uh, release with one of our designers. So that helps. And also working with a developer can help too. So for instance, we did this around Libya operations, where it was just based on a daily press release that NATO put out every day. And each day, they would say, last night, we attacked this, these places and these kind of targets. And we created this interactive, which was just fed off a spreadsheet. It's made by our interactive team of developers. And then all we had to do was just each day fill in the data. And we know that at the end of the war, this was used inside NATO and inside the Ministry of Defense in the UK to showcase what they'd done during operations, which targets they'd hit and what kinds of targets they'd hit. So it, it, a lot of data journalism, I guess, is about finding friends, finding people to work with to best display the information that you have. I'm going to give an example now of how, how we might tell a story using all the kind of techniques that we have, we have at our disposal. And this is a real story. This is based around the riots that happened in 2011 in the UK, which started in London when a man was shot by the police, and they spread throughout the whole country very quickly. Now, the difference in these events to, say, uh, the last events which happened in the early 1980s in Brixton in South London was that then we had to wait for a judge to come back and tell us what had caused the riots. In 2011, that gap was filled by tons of information, by Twitter, by Facebook, by social media, just bombarding you with information. What's going on? What's not going on? What's a lie? What's true? And we could see that there was a, a way for us to help people kind of guide them through that process. 
So one of the things we did, and this is still the single most popular thing we've ever done on the site, was just a map. And all that map showed was verified incidents that we could prove had happened. So this place had been looted, this place was dangerous to go to. And that was incredibly popular. It did about a million pages in a day because people really wanted to know if they could get home that night. They were really hungry for that kind of raw information that actually told them what was going on. And the other thing we did was we started to look at what kinds of people were being arrested. And we had to get hold of court records. And in the end, uh, thanks to Ministry of Justice, we got sent thousands of court records from people who were involved in the riots. And we wanted to know were they being treated differently to people who weren't involved in the riots. You know, what kind, where, where were they from? Were they young? Were they old? And it was some really important data. And this is, a, this is an actual court report from the time. And it gives you a lot of information about people's addresses, their ages, um, where they were arrested and where they came from. But it meant we could do things like this. So, for instance, the Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron, said very specifically that the riots were not about poverty, which is an interesting thing to say, only a couple of days after the event and with no kind of evidence. But we had the location of incidents and we had the locations of people's addresses. And this is, so we put those on top of a map of poverty in England. So this is what that shows. The red are poor places, the blue are rich places, basically. And see where the red dots are. Those dots are where people lived. So you can see people lived and came from the poorest parts of the country. And those statistics we came up with were then backed up by the official statistics several months later. So we were able to, as journalists, be, take this very powerful thing of being able to produce our own visualization that tests what the Prime Minister says only minutes after he says it and being able to use a free tool to do it. And that's really changed our work for us. And this became a much bigger project. So, for instance, Twitter gave us 1.6 million riot-related tweets so we could look at how people used Twitter during the riots and whether or not you know, people were tweeting before events or after them and how that worked. And we were inspired by the Detroit project in, um, in Detroit, where after the Detroit riots, they went out on the streets and they asked people what they thought, why they were involved in the riots. And this led to the Reading the Riots project, which was where we worked with academics to look at the causes of the riots. So, for instance, it meant we could do things like this, where we could map people's routes from home to where they were arrested using a company called Ito World. We worked with them for the side of a riot commute. This is London, where people didn't travel very far in London, only a couple of miles. In Manchester, though, because there's one city centre, people travel very far. One guy travelled 30 miles into the centre of Manchester. So we could, the fact that we can test this stuff, again, is a very kind of powerful tool for us. And we could also look at the way people use social media. So, for instance, one of the things that came out, this was the spread of rumours on Twitter. This is something our interactive team made. So this, these red uh, green dots on that interactive are a, a rumour starting, and the red dots are it being squashed. So, for instance, that was the rumour that, that, that the London Eye was on fire which was a, people were taking that seriously during the events. Uh, the next one is a rumour that a children's hospital in Birmingham was being attacked. So this is a way of kind of showing how, you know, with Twitter, Mark Twain said, a lie can be halfway around the world before the truth has got its boots on. And social media obviously encourages that, that speedy spread of a rumour, but it also encourages the truth to catch up. And that's a really important thing. We wanted to show that. And the next stage of the project was to talk to people on the other side of the barricades, the police officers and people in the courts about their experiences. So you can see how data journalism went from being something very quick and dirty almost to something quite sophisticated and academically rigorous, using all the tools that we had at our disposal. And part of that process, I guess, is for us, it's a very most of the work goes in behind the scenes. 80% of the time is the kind of process of coming up with an idea and processing the data and making it work. And at the end of it, you get this output. And that output can be anything. And that's the great thing about data journalism. Now, I don't have very much time now. And I'm going to just talk quickly about how we display some complicated journalism uh, around the idea of the 99% versus the 1%. A lot of data there. We, we thought, how can we do it? So we fell back on using a video, and this is a bit of it. There are some really rich people in the U.S. today. In fact, there are now over 3.1 million millionaires. But these are not the richest of all. The U.S. has over 400 billionaires, more than any other country in the world. Who's at the top of that pile? These three have a combined net worth of $131 billion. That's just over the combined budget shortfall of every state in the U.S. for 2011. More than the cost of the global war on terror in 2010. 
So I say, you know, people talk about data journalism like it's a very complicated thing, but essentially what we were doing with that video was telling a story. This man here is a guy called James Cameron, who is not the director of Avatar and Aliens, I'm afraid, but he is a fantastic Guardian journalist reported from, uh, from Korea in the 50s and from Vietnam in the 60s, but told stories. And he said, famously, that in the future, um, the world will be about computers answering the questions because only computers will know how to get the answers. In a way, that's true. We can ask questions of data using computers now. We would never have been able to in the past. But at the root of what we do is something very, very simple, and that applies anywhere in the world. It applies in Korea and it applies in the UK. At the root of it, it's all about telling stories. Thank you very much.